It's been a pleasure talking to Dr. Andrews, and now we'll begin part two of the interview with Sierra Science CEO, Dr. Bill Andrews. Well, that's another question I have. You know, done a lot of research, read and listened to the lecturers, and when they talk about the blue zones, which uh, I'm sure our audience knows, uh, these are where the long live people uh, tend to have a greater pronouncement of 100 years old or more. But they don't, they don't all, they might be able to move, enjoy life, but they don't have that vibrant appearance and strength and uh, dexterity and physicality that you're talking about. Are you suggesting that if we can lengthen the telomeres, the individual who looks 60, 70, 80 will actually physically look younger as time goes on with the treatment. Is that the goal or will they yes. just feel that, younger? That's absolutely the goal. And my my motto is cure aging or die trying. And so even if it doesn't work on the very first ones, we will continue working on it to make it work. Uh, I can tell you that the blue zones are not so uh, understood anymore. Um, Let's say um, a lot of the blue zones are no longer blues, blue zones, like Milano, Italy, and Okinawa. Uh, the minister of Okinawa, uh, Shira Gazwa, or something like that, I can't remember her name, she's invited me to be there, speak at conferences in uh, Okinawa three times because they don't have the oldest living people. And, and, and the older people are healthier too. So it is, it is they, they do, they, like a, an uh, 80 year old in Okinawa used to look better than an 80 year old in uh, uh, the United States. But it, what has happened is that, and everybody said it was the diet. Okay, well, the diet doesn't hold water anymore. The idea of the diet being the cause doesn't hold water anymore. Because a lot of other zones have been identified with the exact same diet, and the people are actually short lived. The big breakthrough came in understanding these blue zones and I don't know what the opposite of blue zones are, but let's call them red zones. Um, the uh, 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 Dr. Tom Pearl, uh, he went, in, went to this, these blue zones and red zones, and he sequenced the chromosomes of like hundreds of people there. And he found that the incidence of cancer gene causing genes and heart disease causing genes were lower in the uh, blue zones. That had nothing to do with diet. That was just a statistical phenomenon, okay, from partial inbreeding, where the genes weren't as present. And, and now it looks like that's why these people live longer. The reason why the Minister of Okinawa has had me there a long time is because their tourism has plummeted since uh, they're no longer a blue zone. Blue, when they first announced they were blue zone, their tourism just skyrocketed. And they got a lot of people coming there to learn how to live longer and stuff, and now that's downhill so they they would like like us my company Sierra Sciences to uh, set up the first clinic to actually start treating people with our gene therapy or other means in Okinawa so that they can get their tourism back uh, it's so so it's why are why are popul some populations living longer than others it might be just a statistical phenomena anytime you want to randomly just start testing different zones, you're going to find some are longer than others, some live longer than others, but it's, it's more statistical and it, it doesn't stay constant. Let me throw out some things to you that uh, perhaps uh, people are doing, including myself, to uh, maintain youth and see what you think. Saunas, what's your take on those? Um, don't know. In fact, I do saunas all the time. I know they don't hurt. Okay, I've got a good friend here in Reno that uh, sells, I've got another good friend in uh, New York that sells signs and stuff like that, and, and I promote them. But uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I just know they won't hurt, and so, so it's good. It's like, if you're obsessed like I am, you take everything. Okay, so like, for instance, uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of studies showing that there's certain supplements that extend lifespan in mice tremendously, but no studies have shown that they stand lifespan in humans. Uh, and humans are very different than mice. And there's all kinds of reasons why something could work in a mouse and not in a human. But I take them anyway. 
you know, uh, examples are resveratrol, uh, NAD, uh, uh, things that boost NAD like uh, uh, nicotine and riboside, or something called Elysium basis. Um, I've got a whole list of things uh, that I do like that because I know they won't hurt me. I can only guess that they that they might heart help me. And then I take a lot of things that I know will help me, like metformin. Uh, and uh, metformin is is a drug that only uh, diabetics take. But about ten years ago, it was shown that. Uh, it had uh, anti-cancer benefits, like people, diabetics taking metformin had lower instances of cancer than non-diabetics. Then they did another study with, uh, well, no, uh, diabetics taking metformin had a lower incidence of cancer than diabetics that weren't taking it. Then they did a study on non-diabetics and found the same thing. Non-diabetics taking metformin had a lower incidence of cancer than non-diabetics that weren't taking metformin. So I've been on metformin ever since I saw that study, and that's been over 10 years now. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's, uh, 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 there's a lot of things. I, I, I actually, I used to make my list of supplements and stuff available to people so they could, but I didn't make it public. If somebody asked me for it, I'd send it. But now a, a book has come out uh, called The Kaufman Protocol um, that is dead on exactly all the stuff that I used to do. And, and I even learned a few other things to do that I now do too because of that book. It was written by a Dr. Sandra Kaufman. Uh, and I've read every book that ever comes along that talks about supplements and stuff like that that you can do to extend health span and lifespan. And after I read this book, I, I um, got in contact with Dr. Sandra Kaufman and recruited her to be one of the principal investigators on our clinical studies just because of her knowledge of aging and markers of aging and things to do to uh, reverse it. So, uh, but I, I, I still recommend people read this book called The Kaufman Protocol. It's available on Amazon.com. Kaufman is K-A-U-F-M-A-N-N, -N, so one F and two M's. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a really good book, and I, I actually forget what, what question you asked that uh, led me well, we started out with saunas. I was just going to go through a litany of things that I do. I also uh, take basis, and uh, I haven't gotten to the metformin as yet. <clears throat> You're not concerned about any side effects with that in terms of organ function later on? There's, there's a lot of studies saying, suggesting such a thing. I have not experienced anything. I'm very, very good at doing what I call meta-analysis of unflawed scientific peer-reviewed journal studies okay and <clears throat> which is means that there's there'll be a lot of studies saying something like met what all the things that metformin does i'll read all those studies and because of my statistical theory background and stuff and my you know, skills in statistics and things like that i'm really good at identifying improperly done experiments or properly done experiments so i know how to weed those out but then even after that i'll, I'll find all the pro experiments that were done properly, and I'll find that 90% of them say one thing, 10% say another thing. You can always find there's no such thing as 100% of all studies say the exact same result. Then I look closely at those 10%, and I find other flaws in those, and it pretty much gets convinced that I finally get to a final answer, and I believe that metformin is good for you, there's, there's even my own doctor recently sent me a paper saying that uh, metformin uh, actually reduces muscle function. Um, you know, shoot, here I am, an ultra marathon runner. Uh, I've got pretty powerful leg muscles and stuff like that. I've been taking metformin in two years. Maybe it's just for some people. I don't know. That's the other thing is that everybody's different. Uh, and so metformin has been working wonders for me, and so is everything else I've been doing working wonders for me. But I do have, you know, like I said, uh, my own negative control, which is my identical twin brother. Um, and uh, up until like uh, a year ago, he wasn't doing any of these things, but now he's doing everything I'm doing. Uh, and uh, so he doesn't have to worry about side effects because he, he has the exact same genetics as I do. So, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's even like, like, Vaccines, this whole thing about vaccines, a lot of people are getting side effects from vaccinations. Uh, but I think it's just some people because, you know, we all have very different what are called D, D, and J regions in our chromosomes, which are the things that determine 
what kind of complement of antibodies we can have to fight diseases, and everybody's different. So uh, my B, D, and J regions don't seem to have a complement that could make me sensitive to vaccines and uh, metformin and things like that, whereas other people do. So it's, it's a, I think, a case-by-case. Case. People can get tested. It, you know, it's easy to get tested. Get tested beforehand if they want to try these drugs. How about uh, plant-based diets? Have you uh, bought in on that in terms of... Uh... Actually, that, that's, that's really important. I, I See, I, I believe that one of the, the number one cause of aging is inflammation. And so reducing inflammation is probably the most important thing that we can do to extend our lifespan and our health span. Uh, arachidonic acid is, is one of... The, a very inflammatory uh, uh, fatty acid that exists. It only exists in in meats and chicken and uh, fish and dairy. So I, because of that, and because of other reasons that there's other things that are in those things that are inflammatory, I have gone completely vegan, like maybe four years ago. Uh, and uh, I've also, you know, studied a lot of other people's research and stuff, notably uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, yes. uh, who has written a book called uh, Prevent and Curing Heart Disease, but it's all about inflammation, and inflammation is a major cause of heart disease, but it's also a major cause of all other things. And he's, he's pointed out in a lot of studies to support this, and I've done the meta-analysis myself, that um, oils are bad for you. And every, the companies that sell oils want to make you believe that Olive oil is great for your heart and things like that, but it's the exact opposite. Oils are the most calorie-dense uh, foods you can eat, and they're also very inflammatory. Uh, and so I've cut out oils almost completely out of my diet. Uh, and uh, the only other thing I can mention, so I've gone vegan. I'm, I'm very well known for being vegan, no oils, uh, balsamic vinegar. In fact, here's, let me show you. Here's my salad right now that I'm eating, which is, uh, which is the baby romaine with balsamic vinegar in it. I was eating just for the call. Uh, that's I, I eat one of those things every day, five ounces of lettuce with uh, balsamic vinegar. Uh, the other thing that is really important to do is that even though uh, we, we know that non-vegan foods can cause inflammation, even vegan foods can cause inflammation in some people. Okay, so again, everybody's different. So I routinely get tested uh, through a company called ALCAT, A-L-C-A-T, to identify foods that cause inflammation in me, and then I just don't eat those foods. So the goal is, you know, keep inflammation as low as possible. Even when I run a 100-mile race or something like that, I'll go and get my C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, things like that measured to look to see if I have inflammation. The only time I ever see it is if I push really hard. I keep it fun and just have fun and feel like it's a great adventure. Uh, then you know, I, 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 I never have severe uh, inflammation problems. How about fasting? That would be the last one I would ask you. I'm not an expert on that. I, I personally haven't tried that. Um, I do have a lot of friends that are really, really promoting it. I haven't really looked into it, uh, only because I, I, I kind of want it to be the last resort. I, I just don't like fasting. I eat, like I probably eat 10 times a day. I don't have a lunch. I eat a breakfast, I eat a dinner, uh, and then I just eat snacks all through the day. And those like include like uh, uh, grapefruit, uh, apples, um, uh, salad, as you just saw, um, the... Uh, uh, a banana every once in a while. Boy, there's, but mostly the, um, they're all, all vegan. Uh, and uh, I don't know, Reno has one of the, I think the best vegan restaurants on the planet. It's called Grateful Gardens. And I am I eat there practically every day, uh, especially when I have business meetings and stuff like that. I'll take people to lunch there. And it's like, I wish every city had something like Grateful Gardens. I've been to some vegan places and other places and I find out that they, are too high in oils, for instance, but uh, uh, we have a Grateful Gardens, and they're right now only available in in the Reno uh, Sparks area of Nevada. 
Well, I'm envious because I'm one of the few plant-based eaters in my area and uh, Chipotle seems to be one of my major stops and I have to watch the oil on the fajitas as well. So I understand what you're saying. But uh, one thing I did mention about you besides all the things you've done uh, intellectu intellectually and physically is that you have a record for barefoot water skiing. Is that oh, true? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and God, in 1971, I used to hold the world speed record for barefoot water skiing. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, I was, I was, an, I've always been athletic my entire life. And um, <clears throat> I just found out that one day, because I was, I used to go water skiing like three times a day. My, my father had a house on Lake Arrowhead, California, Southern California. And I, just every day I'd go water skiing. And one day I just decided, to give this barefoot water skiing thing a try. I'd heard people doing it. This is back in 1970, 1969 when I uh, learned. And uh, I, I was just went and gave it a shot. And the next thing you know, I put one foot in the water, put the other foot in the water, and there I was barefoot water skiing the very first time I ever tried. And <clears throat> I went so far that after I got done, I was told that I just broke the Southern California distance record. <laughs> On the very first time I tried, I have size 15 feet. They're very thin, and uh, they, they felt like skis, you know, to me. I just when I was barefooting, I didn't I didn't feel any different than being on two skis. Uh, and then somebody comes along and says, "Well, you know, the championship for uh, Southern California distance record is two weeks later." So two weeks later, I entered that and uh, tripled the distance of separate, second place, <laughs> and tripled the all-time record. Uh, it just seemed to be a natural edit. Uh, and then at that time, somebody came in to me and said, you know, the world speed record for barefoot water skiing is only 69 miles per hour, held by a guy named Wayne Williams. And I thought, wow, I could do that. I mean, the because uh, I'd already skied on a ski at over 100 miles per hour in races and stuff. So I, uh, I contacted the National Drag Boat Association and asked them if I could make an attempt on the world record at one, as a exhibition in one of their drag boat races and uh, they said sure and uh, sure enough I broke it went 74.93 miles per hour uh, and uh, uh, broke the record by five miles per hour and then did an exhibition run in Chesapeake and so that was in uh, Oakland Marine Stadium in California then uh, a few months later I tried to break my own record at the in Chesapeake Bay in uh, East Coast and my rope broke while I was going like over 80 miles an hour and uh, I ended up having a terrible fall, got all tackled up in the ropes and stuff and uh, got some really, really good photos of it. But uh, <laughs> uh, my parents were so upset about it that I never, never did that fast up anymore after that. That was, that was probably 1972. So what's your plans at, at this point and what can we do to help people watching? What can we do to help your research uh, so that you can uh, do exactly what you set out to do, and that is cure aging? Well, it's not just my research. There's a really big problem that people don't understand. Uh, you keep hearing about people having coming up, have developed a cure for cancer or a cure for something else, and <clears throat> then you never hear about it again. And when, when I go and investigate these places, I find it's really good science and stuff like that. But they just couldn't get the funding. The funding is the key. And it's like, I don't understand why a lot of these billion, billionaires out there are really interested in uh, funding research to try to cure multiple diseases. But they seem to cater towards the entertainers, the people that are really good on giving a good presentation and a good show. I've become good at show, but my, my major focus is being at the lab bench doing science. And so, so, and, and plus I, I tend to be honest, <laughs> you know, I, I say, well, with, I, I say the likelihood of us getting something done in a certain amount of time is lower than what they want to hear. Whereas somebody else might convince them that, oh, we could have this solved and cured in a year. And then five years later, they're, they're still working on it. Um, but it's like a lot, there's a lot of good science. I know people that have come up with 
cures for pancreatic cancer, something that's thought to be practically impossible to cure. They've got cures. They can't get funding. I have cures for people that have figured out how to uh, prevent AIDS from causing side effects without having to go through the drastic procedures they're going now just by preventing, preventing the uh, uh, cells that get infected from aging from uh, getting sick, um, keeping the cells healthy. I, uh, people, uh, I know people that have developed cures for herpes, things that people say there's no cure for. Uh, I got on and on and on. Uh, heart disease, I know a lot of people have got great discoveries in heart disease, but they don't have the funding to do it. And it's like, if, I wish that some of these uh, billionaires and stuff like that would put together a committee of people that really knew the science, not just people that did a good job of pretending to know the science, uh, and uh, uh, start start funding some of these really great scientific efforts. If, if my company ever got to the point where we were had $100 million extra in the bank and stuff, that's exactly what I would do. I, I consider myself really good at knowing what labs are really doing good science. There's a lot of charlatans out there in every field. And I, 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 I know where I would put my money and stuff like that. And I just can't wait for that day to see that start happening because it's, uh, that's my mission in life. My mission in life isn't to become wealthy. Uh, my mission in life is to get enough money to do all the research I want to do and fund other research that of labs that are really doing good work. But this is, it's somehow we've got to change the attitude of the people that are funding. And there's a lot of organizations that people can donate to. And they don't know that, that their money is terribly misused. Um, they, like, probably 99% of it goes just to fund, to pay for the employees that are working for the organizations. And then, then there's times when, uh, uh, which are very, very often, where they will invest money into projects, but like let's say you don't donated money for cancer research, you can if you trace your money, you could find out that some of it went into uh, uh, plant research or something like that. And I got to say, I have seen this firsthand because uh, I uh, back when I was getting my PhD, um, the the. Uh, moratorium on recombinant DNA research that it was in place at the time prevented me from doing uh, research on humans or or even animals, but I could do research on plants. So I did a lot of research on plants, and even though it wasn't cancer research, I saw a lot of people uh, writing their grants and just making certain they put the word cancer on every page, even though they weren't studying cancer at all. They somehow threw it in. And they got their grants, okay? And they, their research had nothing to do with cancer. So it's, it's like we need a better way of figuring out how the money goes to the right places. And I think there's, there's you know, it takes a handful of people that are really good at, at really identifying these things to get more involved in these, uh, with these billionaires and other funding sources that are pretty much just throwing their money away right now. Um, um, and it's just, I'm sorry to hear, it, but uh, uh, that's, that's, that's all I can think of is, is to tell people to help find funding for not just my research. And, you know, this is really weird to say, but I have competition. I have companies that are working to try to cure aging. They're doing other things than, than I'm doing. I don't consider them competition at all. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they are working on trying to find a cure for my aging. I want to help them as much as I can, and they want to help us. So, so I've, I've noticed that, at least in the anti-aging field, a lot of the really legitimate scientists are all working together, even though they're competitors. Uh, and a lot of the reasons why we started companies, instead of just going and doing our work in an academic lab and getting grants, is because grants are so hard to get. The, scientists, the key scientists spend all their time writing the grants, not doing any science. The universities where these things take place usually have teaching requirements. So, uh, like one quarter of the year, or sometimes half a year, science, scientists can't do any science at all because they're so busy teaching. Uh, so, a lot of us that are really obsessed with trying to really cure an aging have instead taken the route of starting our own small biotech companies and uh, uh, folks in that way because we don't have the publish or perish issue that 
that plagues a lot of research. Uh, scientists have to publish or they don't get grants. And as a result, they end up publishing a lot of papers that are they can't even reproduce themselves. We don't have that problem here. Uh, other companies, you know, I'll, let me just mention companies like uh, BioViva and uh, Sens and things like that. They don't have that problem because they're they're just they're just focused on getting the research done like we are. Um, the uh, um, uh, in 21st century medicine. Um, Another one, um, I, now I feel bad because I'm going to leave a few of them out, but there's, there's a lot of the companies out there that, that are uh, really focused. They're not focused on trying to get publications. They're not tr focused on trying to make a lot of money. They're just focused on trying to cure aging. Uh, the other big obstacle is the FDA. Um, I've been through a lot of clinical studies, uh, and I've seen like criminal things that I would call. It's like clinical clinical studies being shut down just because they created competition for a product that was already on the market. Even though the product was working better in the studies so far, they still halted the clinical studies because of that. Or, or they couldn't figure out a way for the doctors to make enough money if the product got on the market. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, and the pharmaceutical companies, you, you hear this in the news and a lot, but this is actually true in my own observations is the pharmaceutical companies are terrified about, about somebody coming up with a product that works better than theirs and putting them out of business. And the FDA goes along with them all, all the time. It, it's, it's really, I think the FDA is getting better. I think uh, uh, since the Trump administration has gotten I've, I've, here, I, I think I've seen a lot of things change, but it's still not perfect. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of obstacles in the way. So finding ways to get funding, get get regulatory uh, things relaxed. I mean, I consider myself and my company far more interested in safety than the FDA is. You know, when when like in part of wire clinical studies on our gene therapy uh, that's being done by Labella Gene Therapeutics has taken so long, it's just because. Me and my scientists that have been working on the clinical protocols want to make certain that everything is perfect. There's no risk of any harm or safety issue to the patients when we treat them. And, you know, that means the very first patient, too. We don't want to treat a patient, that patient uh, uh, gets sick or something like that, and we say, well, at least we learned how to not to make the second patient sick. Uh, this just happened recently with some um, bispecific uh, antibodies that have been uh, launched in clinical studies for, for cancer uh, treatments. And uh, several of the patients died during the study from of side effects that they didn't expect. Well, that's what I want to avoid. I don't want anything like that happening. Um, and, and, you know, I understand it. I, I hope they fix their problems and can continue. And, then I, I, you know, I know other doctors that have done uh, stem cell research and stuff like that, very, very good doctors that ended up having problems occur, like uh, side effects occur that weren't had nothing to do with the stem cells. It had to do with some technician making a mistake or something like that. And those companies have become blacklisted and, and things. It, it's just uh, awful the way, and I think the FDA has a lot to do with the blacklisting, but I, I think it's it's just too bad that uh, sometimes good scientists, science gets, gets, gets stalled by uh, 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 not enough funding, regulatory issues, and in some cases, uh, legitimate mistakes that you know anybody could be anybody could make. As I had a personal experience with stem cells, uh, the physician, of course, thought the best protocol would be to culture them for a number of weeks. But here in the states, we are not it. allowed to do that. So you have to take it outside the country. The FDA. I just got. Uh, believe me, just before this call, I was in a meeting with two stem cell doctors. Uh, they're really well known, and they, they had told me because of a lot of the things that I just mentioned about stem cell clinics having problems. Uh, <clears throat> they, the FDA is now starting to shut down on companies that expand or culture the stem cells. Uh, but that's a really important thing. Okay, culturing is very important. You so so that's a reason to go outside the country. Uh, Panama. Colombia, Mexico, 
Uh, these places, there's a lot of really good stem cell doctors. And, and again, I'm going to list a few of them. Uh, Dr. Joe Corita in South Florida. Uh, Dr. Chris, uh, uh, I'll shoot his name. Uh, he's in Colorado, and I'm suddenly going blank on his last name. Sorry, Chris. Um, but uh, uh, there's a uh, Regenix, the company Regenix. He yes. runs a company. That's a really legit company. It, it's, it's things like that. They, they are having to do things outside the country or in the case of Regenix, they've been fighting the FDA tooth and nail and winning a lot of cases, which has been very flattered here. But uh, who is some of this? Uh, um, Neil Reardon. Uh, uh, he's got a, he's, he does a lot of his work in Panama. These are really exceptional stem cell people. And again, I'm going to apologize because I didn't say everybody I can think of. But um, the other big problem with the stem cell field and like any field with things that are working, there's a lot of quacks and charlatans out there. So you got to be really careful, uh, really do your due diligence. All these companies are going to try to tell you that they got something that really works. They're going to show data, but it's going to be data that's not passing muster. Uh, and it's I, I don't I don't have a solution. I did there is a YouTube video that I did one time called uh, "How to Know What's Real and Not Real." Um, it's probably the most viral video I've ever done, but if people just Google my name um, and then uh, real and not real and say YouTube video uh, in the search, they, they will find that video. And it tells you actually how to find out what the real legitimate stuff is. There's a lot of misinformation by all the, all the people that have uh, other agendas, of, such as making a lot of money off a product they sell that would compete against uh, other things. How do we find uh, your video, The Immortalists? Hundreds of years from now, we're going to look back and be shocked about this horrible world that we all used to live in, where people used to get old and die. We're interested not in slowing aging down, but in actually reversing it, turning back the biological clock. This is not science fiction. Even if I bring forward the defeat of aging by just one day, you know, that's a hundred thousand lives that I've saved. It's just astronomical. Harvard has actually been able to reverse aging in mice using telomere lengthening technology. Once we are really truly repairing things as fast as they go wrong, game over. We will have the ability to live indefinitely. Curing aging is a race. The clock ticks once, telomerase pushes it back. It ticks again, telomerase pushes it back. If Bill gets to his goal, then our marriage is forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Think about that one. <laughs> I can view myself as a poster boy, so to speak. There's going to be much less difference between people of different chronological ages. This is snake oil and dangerous snake oil. Dr. Andrews is simply a more recent iteration of similar personalities in the past. I'm not surprised that people don't believe us. What I really worry about is the possibility of a sudden breakthrough. A bigger question about humanity as a whole. If my mother had been healthy enough to benefit from these future therapies, then she would very much have wanted to. She had definitely not run out of things that she wanted to do in her life by any means. We are going to find something soon enough to allow my 84-year-old father to see his own aging reversed. Life is so funny. You can learn and learn and learn. And just about the time you learned what you wanted to learn, you die. It sometimes escapes the general public that scientists are actually human beings who enjoy having a good time as well. I really don't know what does happen when a person dies. I want a doctor. There's no glory in dying. So that's a that's a movie. That's a documentary. Uh, it stars me and Aubrey de Grey, uh, Dr. Terry Grossman, who's a doctor I should have mentioned before, a very top doctor. He's actually uh, one of the key doctors. He's, he's got a, uh, uh, offices in Colorado, uh, north of uh, 
Denver, but he's also got offices in, in Thailand uh, and uh, at Bumrun Grad Hospital. <clears throat> so, but he's he's also in it. Uh, it's a really good movie. Um, it almost won an Oscar. Uh, it uh, made the top ten for best documentaries in 2014, but it didn't make the top five. So the t only the top five got showed during the Academy Awards. Uh, but it's a really, really good movie. Um, and it's available. I just, I always send people to um, www.immortalists. You've got to type the word da, not just immortalists. It's daimmortalist.com. Then after that, put slash watch, W A T C H. Or you can go onto any of the, like Netflix or anything like that, and you can find it right there and rent it and watch it. You can buy it and download it to your TV set. Uh, Apple TV has it, because I know I've watched it recently on Apple TV. I actually, you know, I rarely watch my own stuff, but uh, this movie is so good, I've probably watched it 10 times. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just amazed at the quality of the directors and producers to produce something of that magnitude out of this. Can, can I make one other, like, recommendation? The, sure. The best place on the planet I've been to conferences all over the world. The best place on the planet for people to actually learn what they can do to extend their lifespan and health span enough the, the most is a conference called the Rad Fest. Uh, it's a uh, it's r a a d f e s t dot com. Uh, I speak at that conference every year. People can watch videos of me talking. Uh, in fact, it's this last one. I spend a lot of time talking about why we do die, why do we have aging, things like that, the evolutionary perspectives. I, my PhD is in molecular biology and population biology, so I'm, I'm an expert in both. But it's, it's all of the best doctors are there. Uh, it's like I'm, I'm actually head of the Charlottan police uh, for that conference, and so I make certain that we don't have Charlottan speaking, which is the big problem <laughs> with most other conferences. But I highly recommend that people go to radfest.com and uh, uh, come to some of these conferences. They are the best there is for, for learning everything you can without having to read every book on the planet. We appreciate that. Well, thank you again for your time and your expertise. And uh, I'm going to, uh, my wife always comments on all the supplements I take, but now I have to add one to the list and that's TAM818. So I'll be getting that as well. Yeah. Well, good. And, and you have to buy bigger and bigger containers to hold them all, too. But, uh, and and uh, Dr. Sandra Kaufman just recently told me she's solving that problem, too. So people read the Kaufman protocol, maybe they will learn about ways of doing that. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure being on your show. Oh, pleasure as well. Uh, take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you.